Great. So I will officially uh, announce that the Board of Health October 17th meeting is uh, started, adjourned. Um, and we do not need to read a pre preamble about being remote, but we do need to say each member who is in attendance out loud um, and make sure that all the names are recorded in the minutes. So I will start with myself. Um, I'm Risha Hess, I'm the chair of the Board of Health and I am here. I also see Pramila and Jack, and I think that's all I have to say. I don't think everyone has to say here. Um, so we have two uh, members who are not here. We know that Betsy Brooks is not going to be able uh, to join today and we are waiting for Daya. Is that correct? Yes, I think since we have a quorum with you, Pramila and Jack, we should go ahead and start the meeting and I'll see if I can get in touch with Daya and make sure that she has the info to join. Great. I had the agenda open. All right. So, um, well, the first agenda item is welcoming Daya as our newest member. So that's going to have to wait. <laughs> um, and so we can uh, review and receive the minutes from last month. Um, has anybody, does anyone have any comments or questions or changes that need to happen from the last agenda uh, minutes or um, would someone like to move to approve them? Yeah. Um, uh... I'm opening that zip package and for uh I've had problems with it. Okay, yeah, I'm good, I think. Okay, Premla, did you yes. have any concerns with the minutes from last? Meeting? I did not. Okay. So can we have a motion to approve? Motion to approve the minutes for August 8th, 2024. Yeah, and I'll second. Great. Uh, do I have to do an all in favor thing? I don't know the actual. That's, that, that's yeah, what we used you, to I do. I think you do, yes. <laughs> okay, so uh, I am in favor, Premila. Aye. And Jack. Aye. That seems really silly since you two just said you approved them. <laughs> all right. Um, so the next... Uh, piece of the agenda is our public comment. Um, and unfortunately, I do not have in front of me, what is the, we typically say that there is a length of, of comment that is allowed. Uh, Kiko, do you remember how yeah, long that it's, is? Yeah, it's three minutes. Um, okay. And so I'll just say that um, since I'm the one managing the webinar, I see that there are a lot of people who are attendees who are in the other room. Um, and many of those people are here who are um, to speak on agenda items. So when it's when your particular agenda item comes up, folks who are in the waiting room, I will promote you to panelists so you can be part of the conversation. Um, but if there's anybody in the waiting room right now who wishes to make public comment, so again, not because it's an agenda item that you are going to speak about, but if you are in the waiting room because you wanna make a public comment about something on this agenda, please raise your hand so we can promote you to panelists and have you make your comment. So I'm looking now to see if anyone's raising their hand. And I don't see anything. So I'm going to assume that all the folks in that waiting room are attendees here to speak on their particular agenda item and there are no public comments that are being made aware to me right now. Okay. I also don't see any hands. So I think we will move ahead. Um, and the first, old business, I guess the only old business topic is the tobacco regulations, everyone's favorite. Um, and I think we're hitting the home stretch on these. So what we need to do at this point is do a high level review of uh, just reminding ourselves what's changed, see if there are any concerns or questions um, from any of the board members. Uh, once we are agreed, on any changes or um, then we would vote to move these forward for public comment. Um, and we would schedule a time that 
they would be made public and uh, people could join us to voice any concerns or questions they have about them. So as a reminder of the changes that have been made in this round that are of substance, um, we have eliminated a requirement that um, everybody selling tobacco or tobacco handlers um, take a quiz. We will keep that quiz updated and have it as a resource if people want to use it as a way to ensure that they know the information that's relevant but it will no longer be a requirement. We will remove the automatic seven day suspension for the first violation um, and we'll have a seven day suspension for the second violation. Um, and this really brings us in line with the state violation um, number of days suspensions. We will match the state minimum cigar prices, uh, which is a, a, a slight increase from what they used to be. We will eliminate the restriction that employees selling tobacco have to be age 21 and over, um, simply because that is a that was specific to Amherst um, and was not found to be productive. And then we will combine the state and town fee structures so that there is just one fee structure and it doesn't matter if it's a violation that we have created or that the state has created. Um, we, the, the remaining questions, and I'm, I'm happy to talk about any of those if, if anybody has um, concerns with any of those. The remaining questions here are, and I just wanna get verification. We have a definition in our regulations of what a government issued ID is, and it's, it's a bunch of examples. It can be a, a, a driver's license or a et cetera, et cetera. Um, it does not exist in the state version, and uh, I have recommended that we get rid of it just in case new types of state IDs come out. We don't have to keep updating the regulations with every type that would count, and we just call it a government-issued ID. Um, so that is one thing I'd like to get concurrence on, um, and uh, maybe I'll stop there. There's two more of that level of things, but any concerns with getting rid of the examples and definition of a government I state, a government issued ID? None. Um, well, presumably we're going to keep the word valid, right? I will make sure it's in there. I keep valid. Yep. Okay, thank you for that. The second thing that we need to talk about and, and is uh, we have a 60 day grace period for permit renewal. Um, the state template has a 30 day. We can keep ours more generous or we can move to match the state. Anyone have a strong opinion on that or advice on how to make that decision? It seems to me would be just more streamlined if we match the state. Yeah, I agree. Okay, I'm I'm fine with that. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so match state and grace period. And then the last one, uh, when there is a violation, we can either word it that we shall hold a hearing after four violations or that we may hold a hearing after four violations. So essentially that means, is it a requirement after they have four violations and we are required to meet with them? Um, or do we wanna keep it, if we feel like we need to meet with them then we would after four violations? What would be the alternative to to meeting them, I'm just meeting with them. I mean, I'm just sort of trying to imagine a scenario where where we wouldn't, because it seems as if four is rather a significant number of violations. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, I guess they deal with the suspension and the fines and we wouldn't talk to them at all. And then they'd, when all oh, of that expired, they'd keep going. I see. 
Um, hmm. Is there any guidance uh, or protocol from the state on something like that? I'd have to look at which one they say. Um, Kiko, does anyone have that section open? Violation section B. Okay, so that really isn't. Um, everything else in here says shall, um, but but everything else here is about suspension and fines. So it's just saying that that's an automatic suspension, automatic fine. Um, and then the only thing that has a may on it is that we would meet, that we would hold a hearing with them. And and then it says, well, let me read the whole uh, the whole section. In case of four violations or repeated egregious violations of any section of this regulation, as determined by the Board of Health, within a thirty six month period. The Board of Health may hold a hearing in accordance with this regulation, and after such a hearing, may permanently revoke a, sit a tobacco sales permit. So I think the only reason to hold a violate a meeting, a hearing, would be if we wanted um, to permanently revoke their ability. And I guess the question is, do we want to automatically go into that hearing or is it a, do we want to leave ourselves wiggle room to say we are not that concerned after the fourth violation? Um, and I'm sorry, did you say that what is the state, the language in the state template? Is it shall or may? Did you say that? I don't, I don't have that That's in front of me. That's what you don't have in front of you. I'm seeing yeah. if, see if I can pull it up. Um, Um, Maureen had suggested that we make it shall. Yes, I remember that. And and I think that it was very much feeling that in this is a fairly egregious, you know, four four violations, repeated egregious violations within 36 months. You know, I, I think that these are fairly strong policies and that the general feeling, as I recall, was that we wanted to absolutely hold a hearing um, if somebody was, you know, violating the regulations in this sort of consistent way. That's what I recall, I think, had been yes, talked about before. So just my memory. Yeah, thank you. Sure. I I would be fine with making it shall. Um, it does feel like it's worth talking to them at that point. Um, it doesn't mean an automatic revocation of their license, but it, it's worth talking to them and seeing what's going on. Right. It seems like it would be appropriate to have a hearing if we're talking about permanently revoking a permit. Yeah. Oh, for sure. For sure. Um, I've located it in the state template and it does say shall. Okay. So it sounds no. like everyone's on board with shall, or it looks like I hear C nodding. Correct. <laughs> yes, correct. correct. <laughs> All right. Um, does anyone, so those were the three we hadn't actually answered. Does anyone want to go back to any of the other changes that we made um, and ask any questions or have any concerns with those decisions? Um, on, on page nine, um, well, I guess those were questions for Cheryl, but I, I, I didn't really <clears throat> understand. Um, do you see it like the question, does this wording fit here? And whether yeah, those... it should apply to all tobacco re uh, retailers? Yeah, those were, um, I don't know how they show up in this particular version, but um, they have sort of been closed. Uh, Cheryl did not respond to them and she did respond to the others. And so I think it means that when she did not respond, it's not something that is um, a concern. So we've gone back and looked at the wording. It okay. seems fine. Um, we are making no changes yeah. based on not having heard anything further from her. 
Any other questions, concerns about this? The, if not, the next step would be to say that we vote that this is our, I don't know how the phrasing is, if it's our, our first draft that we're ready to circulate to the public and get comment on, um, but that we're, we're all thinking that this is the way we want to go with these regulations. There is still a chance to change them between now and the official adoption, even if we find anything. Um, but this is the draft we'd circulate to the public. Yeah, and I just wanted to say before people voice an opinion about that, that I think you mentioned this at the beginning, but they're really, this this has taken us way longer than we thought, right? And the initial, <laughs> the initial impetus was um, just that it had been some time since these were initially written and they had been revised, you know, I think maybe five years ago, but things are constantly changing. And so the whole section of supporting evidence is new. Like that's all new in this, in these new, in these regulations that was taken from the state template. So it was really this idea of things have changed. There's new evidence to cite. There are also some other little bits and pieces that could be made more current. Let's use the state template and let's allow that to basically inform what we're doing here in Amherst. So that's what we decided to do. I think that it's, um, there have been other things that have come up around the issue of tobacco since we started having this conversation, one of which is the nicotine-free generation policies, which are uh, there was a regulation passed in Brookline, and I think other municipalities are talking about that or considering it. And I'm certainly not introducing that as a topic right now, but just to say <laughs> that I think it's good that we get this done and that we have the hearing. And as time rolls by, there may be a need to look at it again, because this is a constantly changing environment when it comes to nicotine products and tobacco products. So just to set a little context there for folks. Great, thank you. All right, so one more chance to ask any questions. And if not, if someone wants to move to approve this as our, uh, Kiko, I don't have the language. It, it's not a draft, but it's a, The, these because um, we can't vote on them until the public comments but we can right. vote to say this is the yeah i think it's the the final revised regulations something like that i guess <laughs> the final draft of the revised regulations <laughs> okay i like that um I'll make the motion to accept um, the final draft of the tobacco regulations. You're muted, Jeff. I was muted. Yeah, I second. Sorry. Okay. So all in favor, Premila? Aye. Jack? Aye. Me, I, yay, <laughs> such progress. <laughs> Wonderful. It's been All a right. long road. It has been a long road. <laughs> so now we're going over to new business and Kiko, I'm gonna turn it over to you um, about the next agenda items. Okay, great. So um, before I do that, I just wanna say, uh, I did reach out to Daya or try to reach her via email text, did not get a response. I just wanted to say out loud, Daya, are you in the waiting room under a different name that I don't recognize? Because if you are, please do raise your hand so that I can promote you to panelist. Um, so then our next, uh, our, the next, the first item of on the agenda under new business is to discuss the Amherst College Geothermal Well Project. And I believe we have I think it's Chris and uh, Lindsay, and I'm not sure who else. Okay, they're raising their hands. So I'm gonna promote you to panelists right now. Hang on, it's just gonna take a second. And Jeff. Okay. Is that working? I see Lindsay, I see Chris and Jeff. Anybody else in the waiting room who wants to be added to the, this conversation, please do raise your hand. Okay. 
Um, and then we have also in the meeting, Susan Malone, um, one of our inspectors here with the town who has been working on this project and connecting with Chris, Jeff, and Lindsay. So Susan, do you want to give a, a brief overview and then turn it over to our guests? Okay, I'll just say very briefly that um, the 151 College Street Amherst College um, geothermal well project started out months ago with two test wells and that came before um, the board and it was discussed and I think um, the proponents are here to um, follow up and so the idea is to actually install another 141 wells and they and my understanding is they want to start with two more test wells that would utilize a different method than what they did a few months ago. But the the overall goal is to have uh, the parking lot that um, is it's included in your package, the layout of the wells, and uh, it'll the the number of wells will pretty much cover this parking lot area. Um, Ed Smith and I had taken photos of that a few months back, and it's essentially the, the same look. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to the applicants. Thank you, Susan. Thanks for having us. Uh, my name is Chris Tate. I'm a capital project manager with Amherst College. And I have Lindsay and Jeff with Silas O'Brien here to provide technical support if we need it. Um, but hopefully, hopefully I do an okay job and they don't kick me under the table. Um, is it okay if I share my screen? Yeah, hopefully you, you could do that. Let's go ahead. Okay, let me know if this looks all right. Um, so this is this is the parcel in question. Um, College Street is to the north, and uh, Amherst College proper is to the left of this page. As you're going down College Street, you go under the train tracks, and then this parcel is, is right past the train tracks across from the hardware store. So you see this is um, one of our parking lots. We call it East Lot. And then behind it is our central energy plant with the big smokestack. Um, and we have another uh, Seymour building back here, which houses some of our facilities operations. So this is the parking lot in question. And then I'll go to another plan. So here is a view of the 141 wells plus the two wells circled in red that we already put in in March. Um, so this is kind of the layout. Uh, these wells are, sorry, these are closed loop geothermal bores. They're not wells, um, but it is a well permit, so I, I get a little confused. But um, so these bores are spaced 20 feet apart, and they're 850 feet deep. Um, they're arranged in eight separate circuits. So each circuit, you can see with the lines here, they're all connected together. Um, and these eight circuits all um, are manifolded in an underground vault. And then from that vault, there's uh, two 10 inch lines that come out and come back behind the central energy plant to a new addition, which is this rectangle, uh, which will be our energy center. Um, this energy center houses uh, water source heat pumps as well as air source heat pumps, which can take, which can exchange heat with the ground. Um, and by using this technology, we can use renewable electricity to heat and cool our campus and phase off of using fossil fuels to heat steam, which is what we currently do. So this geothermal um, well field is, is the centerpiece of our climate action goals of decarbonizing Amherst College campus. Um, we've reviewed this project with the Conservation Commission. We have an order, an approved order of conditions from them. We also had a pre-construction meeting with Erin Schock, the wetlands administrator on September 12th. And she's reviewed all of the um, erosion and sedimentation controls for the first phase. Uh, this is a multi-phase project. So there, there will be many phases and many reviews with Erin, um, but we've established erosion and sedimentation controls all along um, the eastern side of the parking lot, it kind of slopes 
this is it's higher up here and then it slopes down to the east and then you can kind of see uh, you can kind of see this is a giant culvert a 52 inch culvert that um, outfalls right off of our property line and becomes Beering Brook so we're trying to protect Beering Brook from any construction activity and we are well monitored by the uh, Conservation Commission in that endeavor. Um, the two test wells that we performed under well permit 24-1 uh, are circled in red. And when we perform, performed those wells, we used a method called air hammer um, technology to, to, to do that. And uh, we weren't especially happy with the water production that was generated from that. So our uh, colleagues at Salus recommended a different method, which is called mud rotary, um, which is more of a closed loop system. And mud doesn't sound very good, but there's actually, a, it's like a formulated clay product bentonite that's mixed with the water. And then that bentonite additive forms like a thin film on the borehole and seals it and prevents water losses while drilling. Um, so we're able to carry the cuttings from the bottom of the well up to the surface to a separator where drier cuttings are discharged and then we can scrape those up and uh, get those off site. And then the rest of the fluid is pumped back into the well and it kind of keeps all the water in one place instead of generating more water, um, which was a concern again, because of fear and brook. Um, Sorry, I'm trying to work on two screens here at the same time. Uh, and then any remedial water that is generated from this mud rotary system will get pumped into two 10,000 gallon weir tanks, which will be located on the high side of the site right here. And a 10,000 gallon clarifier, um, which will discharge into the sanitary system. Uh, one of the, the other things we learned from these test bores was that there's a high concentration of iron in the rock that we're, that we're drilling into. Um, so we're trying to settle out that iron before we discharge into the city or the town sewer. And um, we've already had discussions with Amherst DPW about this. Uh, and we think we have a good plan to get our iron levels below the two milligram per liter uh, range. But in case we don't, we can also, uh, uh, apply for a non-standard discharge permit from Amherst DPW. And there, you know, we've had very good discussions with them. When we do some of these uh, new test bores with the mud rotary system, we're gonna uh, test the effluent and see what we get. And then we're gonna move on from there with DPW. Uh, we also, so Susan took some pictures uh, I haven't seen them, but what we did was we marked out the well locations with little green dots all throughout the parking lot. And this is just, this is showing um, the red are the ones we weren't able to mark out because cars were parked on top of the parking spaces. But all, all of these wells that aren't red were all marked out in the field um, for the health department's review. And I think that's the, the general gist of this project. I, would be happy, more than happy to take your questions. So, um, this is Jack. Uh, what, what's you, the first drilling method you tried was air hammer? That's correct. Okay. And, and that was a problem or what, what are you trying to optimize with, with the additional uh, looking at mud rotary, what was the issue with air hammer? So with air hammer, we actually weren't producing that much water, which is great. You know, we don't want to produce water because it's something that we have to deal with when we right. do. Um, but even, you know, even with the seven gallons per minute, we were finding, you know, just with the one well, we, we filled up like a 5,000 gallon um, tank with water. And okay. um, so to dispose of this water, which, you know, gets all mucked up with the uh, with the rock 
debris, um, you have to bring it to a quarry. And we actually heard um, anecdotally from our friends at Smith College that they were having more and more trouble bringing this, this, you know, backing out this water in a back truck and then driving it to a quarry and trying to dispose of it. Now they're having to go further and further out to get to, you know, other quarries that would take the water. So we're trying to avoid that situation. So we heard that mode rotary is the way to go because we just don't generate a lot of water at all. So we can dispose of the cuttings, you know, the, the dry crushed up rock, but we don't have to also, you know, deal with 5,000 gallons per borehole. And we have a lot of boreholes here. So that's a lot of water to, to get rid of if we were using air hammer. We can't just discharge, um, you know, sometimes drillers will dig a big sediment basin and, and just kind of let the water percolate in. And we just don't have the room to do that on site. And we're also very concerned that any water that kind of escapes is gonna go right into Fear and Brook. And, and we don't want that. So we're trying to keep, we're trying not to generate any water if we can avoid it or the minimal amount. Yeah, so there aren't a heck of a lot of bedrock wells being drilled into the downtown area. So this information is 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 interesting just from a a scientific and water supply standpoint, even you know irrigation water supply uh, standpoint. That's so. Is this curious about um, make you know if this would be public you know available to the public, or whatever, to understand a little bit better. Sure. Uh, you know, groundwater availability in, in that portion of Amherst. Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to, you know, if the board's interested, I can share our uh, our bore logs that we have from these first two. And it, it just says at what depths we encountered groundwater and kind of the amount of groundwater we did encounter. Um, but um hey chris i'll just sorry i lost my train of thought but one thing jack what we don't do which people are more interested in is a flow test so we did not perform any like 48 hour flow tests and then watch the static water level in the hole to see how much it drops and what that tells you is how much water you really have in the ground for like a water well that was not part of our uh testing yeah, I guess one thing I yeah. didn't mention either is that, you know, we're using the term well um, vernacularly yeah. here, but these are closed loop systems. So there's a, a one and a half inch uh, tube that goes down and then it U bends and comes back up. And then we grout around that. So there's no exchange of the fluid in the tube with groundwater at all. Um, so this water generation I'm talking about is only during installation of the bore whole drilling operation and it yeah. has nothing to do with you know we don't want any of the water from the ground we're just putting our our water into the ground to exchange heat with with the ambient ground temperature yeah you you just mentioned the seven gallons per minute that was a um just a rough number i understand but jack that's produced by the air that's not produced by anything else that's produced by the air going down the, the drill stem yeah, and pushing your cuttings up. And as it pushes the cuttings up, it pulls in any water. So it yeah. doesn't give you any indication on what that water bearing zone would produce. Okay. Yeah. What's the diameter of the, of the holes? Uh, what, five and seven eighths. Okay. So thank you for that. Um, what what is the what do we need to vote on or approve at this point? The two additional test wells. No, well, we're asking for all 141 fours, and 
Um, we are going to do a couple of bores uh, this fall because we need that information that'll help us plan what we do next year. But we, you know, we plan to move forward with this entire project um, both this fall and next year. So Jack, as our resident expert, do you have any concerns or? No, I mean, I, I, uh... I think we we uh, talking to Kiko that you know the, um, from a health perspective, there's pretty you know minimal uh, concern here. Conscom's been involved. Um, looks like the waste management you know is being you know taken care of. Um, in terms of the you know the waste streams, you know the water going to the DPW, it's going to be treated beforehand and all that. So. Um, yeah, I, I don't have any other questions or concerns. And so just to add, and just to make sure that we're clear, so you did come before the board for the two test wells, which were approved. And then, yeah. Um, and then now you're, you're explaining that that methodology that you used is actually not the one you want to use, and you're going to use something else, and you're going to do two, you're going to test that presumably in the fall, is that what you said, or next spring? In the fall, yeah, we want to. We're not worried about the method. We're just interested in the production, how quickly you can drill a well, because that'll help us plan for next. How spring, long it will take you to do the whole fall. thing? Right. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. So then, um, yeah, I think initially we did it in stages because the board wanted to approve the test wells and then see what would happen from there. And so now you're doing a different methodology. So I, the board could conceivably say, oh, we want to wait till you do those before we approve the whole project. What I'm hearing from Jack is that there's probably no need to do that, but I just wanted to be crystal clear about, about that. So yes, is that right, Jack? Correct. Okay. And Susan, do you have anything else to add? No, I, I think um, they did a good job with the presentation, so I don't have any other questions or comments. Thank you. Great. So does someone want to move to approve the 141 wells, including two more test wells? Uh, so moved. I guess I can oh. second. <laughs> um, all right. So all in favor, Jack? Uh, aye. Pramila? Aye. And me. Hi. There you go. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for joining. Yeah, the thank meeting. you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks. Um, okay. So before we move on to the next agenda item, I wanted to mention I did hear from Daya and there was a scheduling um misunderstanding. And so she's not going to be joining us. She thought the meeting started at seven. So she's not available right now. So she wanted me to convey her apologies. Sorry about that. This was, I think we're just not really in the flow with all the changes that we've made and whatnot. But at the end of today's meeting, we will try to schedule, um, you know, our, a set schedule of next meet of meetings going forward. So sorry not to have her with us today. Um, so then the next um, item is the drinking water well application at 354 Henry Street. And again, Susan, I'm going to turn it to you to. Okay, thank oh, you. And thank Alexander you. wants to be promoted to panelist. Okay, promoting yep. you just a moment. There we go. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Kiko. Um, so this is a um, drinking water well, private um, well, and the uh, board had already approved the and issued a permit to construct the well. The next step that we go through in the process is um, to review and approve the water supply certificate, uh, which is a certificate stating that the water um, has been tested and is safe for human consumption. And so um, the applicant, um, Alex Niefer, has provided the required documentation, which includes 
uh, laboratory testing of the water. Uh, the testing included all of the uh, local uh, Amherst requirements for drinking water testing. And there was uh, nothing significant in the lab report, except that it's a little bit high um, manganese, but that is not um, uh, significant to health or safety. Uh, uh, let's see, there was also, it also supplied the um, well completion report from the driller, which gave information on the uh, yield um, of seven gallons per minute. Um, and some of this information was used in order to um, uh, 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 provide the volume of requ the required volume of water. So uh, in looking at that, it's a pretty, Amherst regulations have a pretty straightforward um, uh, equation where the number of bedrooms plus one bedroom is multiplied times uh, 110 gallons per bedroom times a safety factor of two to yield the number of gallons needed daily. And uh, uh, Alex computed this and came up with 1,100 gallons um, daily. Uh, he could have provided some additional information because he does have a storage tank in the basement. And he could have also calculated some storage uh, capacity within the well itself, but this wasn't really necessary. Um, he was able to provide documentation of the required volume. And then the final item that was is requested um, for the well supply certificate is um, an as-built statement. And Alex, who provided the original design, provided a final um, drawing so that it was consistent and it was built as planned in the location planned. So with that, um, I can say that uh, the applicants met all of the requirements that the Board of Health um, asked for uh, in order to approve a water supply certificate. Um, I, I don't know if Alex would like to make any additional comments or if anyone has any questions. Other than thank you, Susan, I um, I really appreciate as a as a homeowner, um, general contractor, um, I really appreciate your guidance, um, you know, through this process, and um, you know, both both you and, and the previous health inspector Ed were really fantastic in helping navigate this this complicated process. So thank you. Um, because Susan, sorry, go sorry. ahead, Michelle. I know I was just going to ask because uh, I am new to this process, except for the last time we, uh, I haven't gone the whole way through. Is there anything else after this? Is this the the final step, or do you have one any more steps after this? This is pretty much the final step. Okay. Um, uh, in that uh, it, it, it's it's a long process. I'll tell you. Yeah. And <laughs> And, and we went back and forth quite a bit because under our new um, permitting system, our OpenGov system, this was the first drinking um, water uh, well and water supply certificate that I've looked at uh, since I, I've um, assumed these responsibilities. So there, there's been a lot of discussion back and forth uh, between Alex and I and the driller and I. And um, also Jack was really helpful, spent some time with me uh, reviewing what requirements we have in place and understanding those requirements. So um, at this point, I'm as confident as I'm going to be that we are we are all set to go. Um, if I could ask one question, and um, thank you, Alex, for being here, and thank you, Susan, for your present for your summary. Um, so Daya is not here, um, but Daya did review all the materials, and as a biochemist, had a particular question, which was about the manganese level um, in the water. 
you know, exceeding the CMR levels, not by much, but, you know, by a little bit. And so her question was about, you know, given the neurotoxic effect of long-term exposure to manganese, is, is, is that a, I mean, again, I'm new to this, Susan, you've reviewed these water um, samples more than I have. Jack, you probably have some knowledge about this as well. Is this something that we, where we would recommend water filtration, whether the board would recommend something like that, or what is the, how would this be, you know, is it a concern and how should it be addressed if so? So, Susan, if I might jump in, um, Kiko, sure. I've, we've already been proactive um, with this, and we've actually um, consulted with uh, our plumber and a filtration expert um, company, and we've had uh, water filtration installed. Um, so we, we already have this. The, the okay. manganese is already being taken care of through filtration. So good to know. I'm just glad yeah. to hear that. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, we, I mean, we, I, I read through all the, the EPA, EPA reports and everything, especially you know the effects on pregnant women and children and yeah, yeah, we were yep. proactive with that. So excellent, thank you. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, I mean, mag <clears throat> manganese is being a secondary um, uh, water quality goal. It, the health impact, the health impacts aren't really integrated into any rulings, you know, at this point in time. Um, but that's, I mean, so it's related to you know taste, odor. Uh, uh, how the water, you know, staining and things like that. So, but uh, I'm not as aware of of the health effects that you're you're talking about. That's it's maybe it's it's more on the uh, emerging emerging sort of uh, kind of research side of things with regard to water quality, drinking water quality. But I would not be concerned about. You know, drinking it, but it's it's always these, just whether you like the water. <laughs> so you you'll or the, be or, in the, or the smell of the water. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so if there was um, a a pregnant woman or an infant in the household, we would have some concerns and have an advisory. And I did share with Alex some. Uh, material on it, but but that's not the case. So we don't feel that there's going to be any negative health impact. And what is the filtration system you've installed? Oh, I should have I should have pulled the documentation. Um, I mean, is it osmosis? Is it? Um, I'll have to, I'll have to, if, if you'd like, I could forward the information through to take photos and, and forward the information on, but I, I you know, I, given our, our timeline, I'd, I'd hate for that filtration system documentation to, to forestall any sort of approval today, especially if it's not, you know, um, a requirement. Sure. I think it would be useful to, to share it, but I think we can go forward knowing okay. that that's yeah. coming. I'll absolutely share that. I'll, I'll do that later tonight and forward it on to, to Susan for dissemination. Great. Okay, so should we move to approve? And I'm so bad with these language. Uh, the drinking water, what, what is the name of the thing we need to approve? It's the drinking water well application at 354 Henry Street. And so, spe okay. and specifically, the water supply certificate. Thank you, Susan. All right. Can we get a motion to approve the water supply certificate? So moved. Second. All right. Uh, and all in favor? Jack? Uh, aye. Pramila? Aye. And myself? <clears throat> aye. It is approved. Thank you everyone for your time. I appreciate that. I'll also Thank send a, a, a photo of the water filtration system as installed as well for you. Great. So. Thank you, All Alex. Right. Thanks, Kiko. Um, Susan, did you want to raise um, the questions that you had about well water applications in general, just briefly uh, to be discussed sure. in more detail at another meeting? Yeah. Sure. And um, so I met with Kiko and with Jack and talked about um, how we wanted to proceed in the future with the water supply certificate. And there is, you know, the, the stated documents, just as Alex has provided, and it's 
um, in the recent past, it's gone both ways where the approval of the certificate has actually been scheduled at a meeting and gone before the Board of Health, but also um, over several years, uh, that step was um, approved by um, the, the health agent reviewing the application. So my question mainly is, how would you like to proceed going forward? Would you like to see every water supply certificate um, uh, at, uh, step? Because you the drinking water well application, permission to construct the well does come before uh, the Board of Health. Um, and this is an additional step. And so uh, I just, am setting that before you and you may want to take some time and have some discussion and decide uh, but we just want um, asking for some clarity uh, as uh, agent of the board of health reviewing applications regularly we just want to know we're bringing to the board the things that you actually want to uh, see and discuss and have approval over or if you want to delegate um, that task to us Thanks, Kiko. So yeah, I, I, go ahead, John, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, uh, chime in that from my perspective, the it, it seems to be flip-flopped in terms of what we're looking at in terms of the 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 first part, which is the the well drilling application versus the the water certificate. For me, like the Board of Health are our our mission would be more in tune with reviewing only the water certificate and not looking at the 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 drilling because the drilling is more set by by other factors that aren't directly uh health related that can be handled by um say the um the building inspector you know planning what you know has the well you know for drinking water purpose has to be a certain distance you know all that i think uh from say the septic system and and you know the property boundary all that is taken care of by other uh governing uh boards is my understanding so my feeling is i i think we should be looking at this final phase that has the water quality information in it that has health impacts associated with it uh versus the early part So I think what we talked about is, um, so there might be some tweaks then to this process that Jack is recommending and that also Susan was wondering about whether some applications wouldn't need to come before the board if there's a checklist and the health agent can be empowered just to do the checklist and not have to come before the board. So I think what we could do for the next meeting is just like we did with the geothermal wells where Tim put together kind of a list of guidelines of things that need to come before the board and things that don't, that um, Jack could do something similar. He He's already given us some of his time for these discussions and it sounds like he might be able to just codify what we talked about into a list of recommendations that the board can then approve as to how we how the board interfaces with well applications going forward. Yeah, and, and to that uh, follow-up, I, I, I did receive the the kind of governing uh, literature on that from on the local level is our bylaw and in the state there's a guide right. a guideline and I have not uh, had a chance to kind of go over that and you just know, got it yesterday I just, okay thank you yes <laughs> <laughs> completely reasonable <laughs> yeah well that was my question is where where is this held and what would have to change to change any of ours but this sounds like a good conversation to put on the next agenda Okay. Yeah. Okay, so then moving to item C under new business, which is the Flat Hill Estate Subdivision Plan, which you also received copies of. And Susan, please help me out here. I want to make sure that I'm presenting this correctly. Um, but what this is a, a subdivision plan that has been submitted as is re a requirement for subdivision plans and subdivision plans do become come before the board because generally when you're doing a subdivision, you need to install septic and drinking water wells. Um, however, this particular subdivision, they're being very uh, you know, transparent about, they never intend to build it. Um, 
there have been articles in the Gazette about it, or in, I guess not the Gazette, in the um, the Indy or other places. Um, and I think it's sort of common knowledge in the way that they're talking about it is that they don't intend to build this subdivision. The, the land I think is being set aside if I'm not um, wrong for solar and installation. And so, but it still has to go through this process in which case it will be coming before the board officially at some point in the future. And so this is really more of a heads up. This thing is, this plan is out there for the board's, um, you know, awareness. If that's, is that right, Susan? Did I get that right? Yeah, that's that sounds exactly right. That in order to build a subdivision, to, to build a house, um, it's required yeah. that the builder be able to demonstrate that there will be potable water and there will be sewage yeah, disposal. Yeah. So that's in terms of either a public water supply and sewer system or a private drinking water well and a septic system. But yes, there there's no intention to actually build a subdivision, but they're trying to go through the required steps um, so that the and then will exempt the the requirements. So, but they have to go through a a process to um, to do this. So that, that we've been asked to um, uh, uh, speak to to these requirements. So. And what is required of us now? Is this just a heads up that it's coming? It's just a heads up that it's coming. Okay. I still don't understand why, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> if they're not yeah. building anything, why do we need to approve? But I, I think process. it's oh. it, it's it is a process, and ultimately it'll be stated, these are the requirements and then the applicant's going to request to exempt the requirements. So that, that it, yeah, it's kind of a bumpy process. You're right. <laughs> it, it is, yeah. Um, so ultimately, it, I'm assuming the, the Board of Health doesn't have anything to do with uh, deciding about the freezing of the zoning. That's correct as far as I understand it. I mean, the Board of Health would just that, you know, as, as you said, Susan, the builder has to demonstrate that there's potable water and, you know, a place to build septic when there's new houses being built. And so that's something that the Board of Health would be concerned about. But in terms of what this land, excuse me, can be used for ultimately is not a Board of Health decision as I understand it. Thank you. Okay, shall we move on then to item, the fourth item under new business? Um, okay, so this is uh, about the Oriental Flavor Suspension of License with notice, and there have been some updates about the suspension of license since I put together the Board of, Agen Board of Health agenda at the end of last week. So, and I'm turning it over to Sasha, and I'm going to promote Mr. Zhang, who I see in the meeting waiting room, um, who is the one of the, I believe, owners of the restaurant. So I'm promoting you to panelists, Mr. Zhang, just a moment. That should be happening. And then um, Sasha, turning it over to you. Hey, uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you all for being here. My name is Sasha Clapp. I'm one of the health inspectors. My primary role is conducting food inspections for all the food establishments across Amherst. Uh, this matter has come before the board as a result of repeated inspections due to repeated violations of the provisions related to foodborne illness at the establishment known as Oriental Flavor. Um, the documentation that has been provided to the board shows, again, repeated violations of the provisions related to foodborne illness as a result of 11 inspections, which have been conducted since May 7th, 2024. Uh, these provisions are in particular related to persons in charge not being able to demonstrate the knowledge and responsibilities or duties of the persons in charge, including repeated violations of preparation of sanitizing solution for surfaces, maintaining surfaces in appropriate sanitization, um, repeated violations for hand washing and glove use, repeated violations for cold holding of raw products, repeated violations for, um, sorry, just going through my notes here, uh, employees actively eating and drinking in food preparation areas, 
uh, holding raw meats over ready to eat foods and repeated temperature violations for cooking and cold holding foods. Um, when we find repeated violations or violations of foodborne provisions, food, uh, provisions for foodborne illness, we are required to return to an establishment for reinspection. And as a result of the reinspections, we continue to find violations. Uh, we've required to place new persons in charge at the establishment and have found over the last several months um, no significant improvement with regards to uh, food safety practices. As a result of this, on October 10th, we issued the suspension of permit with notice, notifying Oriental Flavor that their permit would be suspended as a result of this hearing. And that would be effective on October 18th, uh, so tomorrow morning. And then because of an inspection that occurred on October 9th, I returned on October 15th for reinspection. At the time of reinspection, there were six provisions related to foodborne illness or violated provisions related to foodborne illness. Um, in, those included, again, uh, employees eating and drinking in food preparation areas, um, food contact surfaces that were not clean and sanitized, the person in charge, who is the person who ultimately oversees food safety practices, not demonstrating um, knowledge and responsibilities of the person in charge. So essentially not making sure that food safe practices were being implemented in the establishment. Um, and as a result of that, we issued the emergency suspension of license on October 15th. So the establishment was uh, closed by order of the Board of Health uh, without a prior hearing and has been closed since Tuesday. And so today we are here um, to ask for uh, information and guidance as to how best to proceed. Thank you. Before we dive in, can I ask a clarifying question on process? And that is, um, what would the process, is there an automatic time at which a, a suspension is lifted or what has to happen for us? Do we do we have to say something has, has changed and a suspension is lifted? So I suppose I can provide some clarity um, with regards to the expectations um, for orders. So when there are violated provisions of um, so what we call the, the provisions related to foodborne illness. So these are numbers one through 29 on our inspection reports. Uh, we issue orders for correction. Those orders for correction are expected to be corrected within 24 hours unless otherwise specified on the report. So when we go back, we conduct a reinspection, and if those orders are not corrected, then we come back and do another reinspection, which is why there have been 11 inspections over the course of the last five months. Uh, so there have been ample opportunities to, to make sufficient corrections to address the orders that have been provided to the establishment. And so essentially, um, the requirement is to correct the orders. Um, and the orders in this case are to place a person in charge who's able to oversee food safe practices, you know, along with other other orders, which include right, um, appropriately preparing sanitizer, addressing cold holding, um, but ultimately making sure that those food safe practices are in place to protect public health and public safety. Um, so with regards to, to process, um, essentially what, what needs to occur is um, the orders that have been given to the establishment need, need to be corrected. And then I would love to give Susan an opportunity if there's anything that you'd like to add with regards to process, I'd like Susan to have the opportunity to speak. I'll, I'll just say briefly that um, in working with Sasha that um, she really has gone through all of the steps. There was great effort taken to see that there was every opportunity given to educate, to make corrections, to engage a consultant, to meet with Rob Mora, the building commissioner, twice. Uh, ev as I said, every effort has been made to uh, encourage correction of the violations and to engage in safe practices. And just uh, none of these actions have been successful. So that, that brings us to where we are today. 
Thank you both for that clarification. May I also just say, and I apologize if you said this because I have I'm multitasking a little bit, but if you mentioned about the work with the consultant that has happened. Sure, I'm happy to speak on that. Um, part of the orders for correction that were issued after several reinspections uh, that resulted in actually an increase in the provisions related to foodborne illness um, some, sometime between June and September, we had required and after a meeting with our building commissioner, uh, Mr. Rob Mora, we had required that the owners hire a consultant to work uh, with them on food safe practices. Um, part of this was because we were spending a significant number of hours of departmental time uh, with education. So each time I conducted an inspection, I was working with the persons in charge on proper hand washing techniques. Um, so actually spending time with demonstrations for hand washing techniques. Um, education about when to change gloves. So for example, when going between handling um, raw chicken to handling ready to eat foods. So um, raw chicken to serving, for example, rice, right? Something that you don't have to cook again before um, giving to the public. Um, or when you handle trash, uh, you must then remove your, your gloves wash your hands, change your gloves before handling food. Um, so we did a lot of education there. And then we also did a significant number of hours of education uh, with the preparation, the proper preparation of sanitizing solution, um, how to make the sanitizing solution to properly sanitize dishes and uh, surfaces. And when that was unsuccessful, um, one strategy that we have in our toolkit available to us is to order the establishment to hire an outside consultant. And these are folks who are certified and accredited through the state to train food establishments on food safe practices. And so Oriental Flavor hired Mojin Solutions uh, to work with them to train all of their staff on food safe practices to effectively handle food. They submitted to us documentation and they also submitted to us mock inspection reports. And those mock inspection reports also cited provisions related to foodborne illness, uh, similar to the, the documented uh, violations that I found. Not as many, um, but they were still finding with their consultant violated provisions. And they were similar provisions, right? Cold holding violations. So for example, all food that's held in refrigeration for service to the public needs to be held under 41 degrees. Um, some foods were held at a temperature of over 65 degrees. Um, so if we think about, right, for example, raw chicken needs to be held under 41 degrees to prevent the growth of bacteria. We were finding chicken at 58 or sometimes 65 degrees. Um, there were citation for food being held in hand washing sinks. So in an establishment, a sink needs to be specific for one function. So when we wash our hands, we're removing contamination from our hands. So a hand wash sink is labeled hand wash only. And we don't do food preparation in the hand wash sink because when we wash our hands, we're removing contamination from our hands. We don't want to also be washing lettuce or washing food in that same sink. And so one of the other citations was that there was food stored in a hand washing sink. Right, so these are some examples of the violations that were commonly cited. The consultant also found violations of, again, hand washing not being observed in employees and glove use not being observed appropriately in employees. And what's more pertinent, rather than just these kind of one-off situations, is that the person in charge, which is a term that we use in food code, the person in charge is often a manager, a food protection manager. They, they have a certificate in this. That person in charge is responsible for overseeing the food safe practices. So when your health inspector is not there, this person is responsible for ensuring that the food that leaves the establishment is safe to serve to the public. And what we found through these 11 inspections and through the three inspections that were conducted by the consultant is that the persons in charge at Oriental Flavor were not able to demonstrate that the food leaving the establishment was safe for public consumption through these documented violations of provisions related to foodborne illness. And so the concern is we want to make sure that the food that is being served from the establishments in Amherst is safe for the public and that we're minimizing the risk of foodborne illness when we're serving food to the public. And that's our responsibility and that's the shared responsibility of the persons in charge. So that is the question that we have before us today. Thank you, Sasha, just, for that additional detail. Kiko, if, if I could just add briefly, uh, you know, we're 
Sasha's done a great job of describing, you know, how we're regulating and uh, the the um, requirements that that we put in place. But j just to, you know, the impact of this is basically when you when we've gone in repeatedly, Sasha especially gone in and say, here's how you make a sanitizer so that the dishes come out clean and the utensils come out clean so you can use them after people have been eating with these and drinking with these things here's how you make a sanitizer you take a cap full of bleach you put it in this this bucket that measures out an amount of water and now you've got sanitizer and here we're going to take a test strip and this is how we're going to prove that it has enough sanitizer in it dip that test strip in for in the water for three seconds and come out to do that repeatedly over and over and over again and not have the person who's entrusted with doing that be able to perform it independently of the inspector um, is, is appalling. It, it, we, we don't see that, that we don't see this level of um, inability to conform to the regulations. We don't see this typically in establishments. The, the huge number of violations, the gross violations, this, this is rare. We, we will see violations, but they get corrected um, and they should not be repeated. And I would ask um, uh, Sasha to describe um, one of her anecdotes of going in. Um, this is the issue with the glove and the raw chicken and the rice. And I'd ask her to describe that for you. Right. So, you know, there was an, an instance where I did observe an employee who had just handled raw chicken, who then went from handling raw chicken with a gloved hand to then immediately handle ready to serve rice. So rice that was going to be immediately served to a customer. Um, so this is what we consider a ready to eat food. Um, after handling a raw protein. Um, so this is an immediate risk for contamination because uh, raw chicken is, of course, a uh, high risk food. Chicken needs to be cooked to an internal temperature of 165 degrees. So when you go from having a contaminated glove and then handling um, rice that's going to be served to a customer immediately. Uh, this was a significant risk and probably for me, one of the, the most uh, illuminating examples of a contamination that occurred at the establishment. Um, you know, with the additions of food stored on the floor, um, inappropriate cooling methods, which we see pretty pretty consistently. Of course, um, you know, Oriental Flavor is working really diligently to improve uh, cooling logs and to improve cooling temperatures, but we're just not seeing the significant progress that's required to ensure uh, that we're reducing foodborne illness risk. Um, and we're just not seeing the corrections that are required to, to protect food safety. Thank you. Um, and I think, as Susan said, these are the standards that other restaurants in Amherst are being held to and that other restaurants in Amherst are working towards. You know, as, as Susan said, there are sometimes violations, but not to the degree that we are seeing that, that Sasha and Susan have seen at Oriental Flavor. And this is an expectation if you have a restaurant in Amherst that you adhere, or anywhere in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts that you adhere to these food codes. Um, so I think you've heard a lot, Risha, Jack, and Pramila, and I'm wondering if you have questions or comments at this point. And, and maybe we can just, I, I also wonder if we would like to hear from Mr. Zhang, uh, if he has anything he would like to add at this juncture. Before we do that, I wanted to say that I think the question before the board is, and Sasha, Susan, please tell me if I'm getting this wrong, that um, but when we put the, together the agenda, the license had not been yet been suspended. It was suspension with notice. On Tuesday, when Sasha went in, not, there were additional violations. So that was an emergency closure happened on Tuesday. Otherwise, it would have been closing tomorrow. And this would have been the hearing prior to that closing. But now it's already been closed. And the question is, what does the board want to see happen in order for this restaurant to be able to reopen? And Sasha has made it pretty clear that the main concern is that there must be a person in charge who can ensure that food safe practices are being conducted on a consistent and sustained basis. So I think that's the question. Did I get that? Did I summarize that well? 
Sasha, Susan, anything you want to add? Sure. So, you know, I think I absolutely think that that has addressed kind of where we're at in terms of the situation. With regards to a person in charge, we have asked, you know, as again, one of our tools in our toolkit, we have asked several times that a new person in charge be placed. Um, we've asked that Mr. Zheng be re replaced as a person in charge. We've asked that Kidong be, be replaced as a person in charge. Um, they've named Mr. Deng as a person in charge at the most recent inspection, and we were still finding provisions related to foodborne illness. So at this time, we need somebody who's able to exhibit the authority over the persons who are working in the kitchen um, to, to ensure that we're having food safe practices. So I think that really is kind of the concern um, that, that faces the board at this time. Yeah. So, Kiko, if I can summarize and speak to your point, um, the the orders have been issued by uh, Sasha to suspend the license. So the question before the board is to either allow the suspension um, with the, and there's conditions that um, the suspension stays in place until it's demonstrated that corrections have been made, or the board may choose to overturn the orders. So basically that's what's before the board to either allow the orders to uh, suspend to stand or to overturn. Thank you so much, Susan, for that. Um, so that's the question then, and I, I just want to ask the board, do you want to hear from Mr. Zhang or are there further comments, questions before we do that? I would like to hear from Mr. Zhang. Mr. Zhang, do you have some comments you'd like to make? And you can unmute yourself to make a comment. And we don't hear anything. I don't know if you're talking, but if you are, we can't hear you. So maybe we continue with the discussion. And Mr. Zhang, if you want to chime in, please just unmute and begin talking. Um, but Risha, Jack, Premila, the question before you. So this is my first uh, food safety um, hearing or, or case. Um, so how how is the how is the observations uh, made? Are is someone there for a period like ten minutes, an hour, multiple hours? How is how is this inform how is information gathered? Because to me, it seems like it, it, if you knew the health inspector would, was coming, you would want to get things in order, at least, you know, for that time period. And then uh, I can see maybe a lapse. But if they knew you were coming and then you saw what you saw, um, I'm just I'm just wondering in practice how how does a restaurant owner or or you know a kitchen respond to such inspections Sure. So I can speak on our general practice um, with regards to health inspections in the department. So every establishment in Amherst is subject to two unannounced inspections that occur throughout the year. These typically occur approximately six months apart. Uh, so again, these are unannounced. They can occur at any time when the establishment is open for routine uh, business hours. And so uh, the first inspection that occurred was on May 7th, and this was the, the first unannounced inspection for, for this half of the year. Um, and when that inspection occurred, there were 11 violated provisions related to foodborne illness. Uh, the expectation, again, is, is zero. Um, and as a result of, of that inspection, I went back on May 16th for a reinspection. I informed them that I would be back for a reinspection within a week and gave them some time to make the 
corrections that were necessary. So they, I was there for approximately an hour. I think it was closer to an hour and a half. I would have to check the inspection report, which does state the time that I arrive and the time that I leave. So those are available on all of the inspection reports. Um, but most inspections um, for me are a, approximately an hour. Um, and they, they range from about 45 minutes to, to about an hour, I would say. Um, and so when I returned on May 16th, there were eight violated provisions uh, related to foodborne illness. And again, there were additional violations. So this is only the one through 29 violations. There were additional violations. So on May 7th, there were a total of 16. On May 16th, 16th, there was a total of 13 violations. So we did announce uh, the reinspection date. Um, and then over the course of the last five months, some of these inspections were unannounced uh, with regards to what specific date and time I would be there. And some of them were specifically announced. They were scheduled inspections. I informed them specifically of what time, uh, what date I would be arriving. And part of that was to uh, work cohesively with the establishment owner, the persons in charge, and their consultant to ensure that we would have kind of a cohesive inspection. So again, that's not necessarily the norm. Uh, to have a scheduled inspection, but we did work cohesively, so they were anticipating me. Uh, this last Tuesday, I was expected because I did indicate on the inspection report on the 9th that I would be returning on the 15th for a reinspection. So I was anticipated uh, that I would be back to conduct a reinspection. So I, does that help to answer the question? Yes. Yeah. Okay. The process, I, again, my, my first introduction to this type of thing. So I appreciate it. Um, I have a question. I was wondering if it, if it felt at any point like language was a barrier and that there needed to be a translator present in terms of co conveying the concerns and so on. Yes, uh, it did initially. And so part of our initiative in, in May was actually to work with the translation service that was offered through the, the public health program. And so uh, in part of the summary that was provided to the board, I indicated that in May on the 23rd, I was accompanied by Olivia Lara Cahoon, who's our uh, registered nurse, our public health nurse, and she had the translation service available um, by telephone because we had had at that point two inspections with pretty serious violations, and we were able to review those inspection reports in detail with the translation service uh, with Mr. Gijong, who's one of the persons in charge, and with Ning, who's another person in charge at the establishment. At the time, Mr. Zhang was not in, in uh, the area. He was not available. I believe he was out of country, although I, I would hope he would correct me if I was wrong. That was what was communicated to me. Um, and so we did communicate the severity of the violations. Uh, the translation service helped us with, with this. Uh, we also have Pocket Talk available to us. Uh, this is a device that's available. Um, and then there are a few employees at the establishment who do help to translate um, when we are uh, on site. But initially, I did think that this could potentially be a barrier. Um, and so we were working with, you know, the consultants who are available and they are fluent in both languages. So initially this was a concern that I had, although this was quickly mitigated um, by the communications that were had with our translation services and the resources that we have available to us. Thank you. I don't think I have any questions for Sasha or Susan. I mean, I, I am regretful that we cannot speak to the establishment right now because I think my questions are really, the, you know, the, the safety has to be paramount, but obviously we also want restaurants in Amherst and we want them to succeed in Amherst. And so what does it take to get us over these problems and, and to a, um, you know, to reopening um, and what's it going to need. So th those would have been my questions. I don't think uh, they can be answered by <laughs> by anyone but the establishment. Yeah, and, and just in the interest of trying to have them participate, I just sent an email to Mr. Zhang. Um, I don't know if you have a telephone number for him, Sasha, because I just wonder, 
is there something wrong with the phone? Is he trying to unmute and say something and he's not able to? I, I don't, there's no way to chat through this webinar feature. So I just wanna make sure that we make every effort to have him participate in the conversation if he wants to. Yeah, let me give him a call. Thank you. Um, I also wanted to clarify if we, do you want me to hang on while Sasha uh, calls Mr. Chang? You're Sorry, muted. I was muted. Uh, I think it's okay to keep talking to you. Were you going to say the same, Risha? So I just wanted to understand if we decide to uphold the suspension, then the steps for the establishment to uh, regain the license, um, the, their established steps, I'm assuming, that the uh, health department goes through. Yes, that they, they um, all they have to do is demonstrate to us that they have corrected violations. So this is principally hangs around having a person who's in charge, who's trained and, and able to make sure that uh, they are uh, engaging in safe practices. You now you just have someone on site who's who's certified. The certification itself is supposed to be a demonstration that um, the person in charge is knowledgeable, understands the requirements. You have to make sure you're sending workers to wash their hands regularly and appropriately, that they're using gloves appropriately, that they're cooking food to the right temperature. You're not serving um, undercooked food that can make people sick. You know, no one wants to eat undercooked chicken. Um, that's a real safety mm -hmm. hazard. Um, no one's taking mm -hmm. um, gloves that are laden with raw chicken and scooping out by hand uh, rice to stick on a, a plate that is gonna be sent out to the dining room for someone to eat. Um, that that's supposed to be but when it can't be demonstrated when you have the certificate and despite having it you do not exercise your knowledge in an appropriate way and supervise the staff um to do all of these things appropriately that's where we're at and and this is all we have ever asked so so throughout all these inspections and reinspections throughout the training with a consultant the, it's we have always asked the same thing. Just demonstrate that um, you can effectively utilize safe practices. And so as soon as they, they are prepared to do that, um, we, we would have that discussion um, and we would go in and um, uh, re-inspect. And if we see those safe practices in place, we would allow them to um, uh, 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 operate again. So, so yeah, it, it's, um, okay. it's, it's pretty straightforward. You just have to do the right thing. Thank you. So Sasha did get in touch with Mr. Zhang and he's rejoined. I'm trying to make sure he can unmute and join the conversation. She's on the phone with him right now. While we're waiting, Kiko, I, I just wanted to add one more comment. Oh, yeah, I think he's on now. I think he's coming. Okay. We, go ahead, Mr. Zhang. Mr. Zhang, can you hear us? Uh, it looks like he's unmuted. You look to be unmuted, but we don't hear anything. At least I don't. Sasha. How about his volume? Does he need to increase the volume or? And Sasha, you're muted. If you're talking to us, you're muted as well right now. Mr. Shen, can you turn up the volume on your phone? He can hear us. Oh, how funny. We just can't hear him. 
Hmm. Are you able, but you can hear him, Sasha? I just had him on the phone. I'll call him back. Can you, because the what you could do is put him on speaker in your cube yep. and maybe we can hear him that way. Okay. I think it we might be if if that works, we might want to mute his call in. Okay, I just did that. Okay, and um, it may be that he doesn't have Zoom on his phone, so the the capability is not there for him to talk. I don't know. His probably his mic is not activated on his telephone. I guess. I look star. Okay. Can you hear us okay? Uh, now okay. Hear... Okay. So Mr. Shang, we can hear you on the Zoom. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah, now I can hear. Okay. 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 Yeah, uh, so, so I'm not in good condition right now. Yeah, so, but uh, first of all, I'm very qualified for the uh, for the violation, yeah. And uh, we are working very hard for uh, improvement. Yeah, right now, still have the state working in the kitchen right now. They, they clean every corner, every space, yeah. safe cleaning and sanitize. I just want to continue to service this community. Yeah. And also, I appreciate uh, the, the Sasa inspector to help us improve and uh, appreciate uh, all the local customers always supporting us. And we, we want to return to them. And uh, we we still trading, we still working hard. I don't know how. What can I say? Right now? Sorry, what language Yeah, thank you, Mr. Zheng. I think Risha has a question for you, our Board of Health Chair. Do you, yes. Did you want to ask your questions from before? Sure, um, and, and thank you. And you, I think we share the same goal of wanting to have you reopened and safely um, operating as a restaurant in Amherst. Um, is there anything that you have identified that you require in order to be able to meet the requirements? Um, yeah, we, we totally have. Yeah, we, we believe we can do much better. Than that. Okay. Um, and is there a plan from your end to um, on how you're going to be able to to fix the yeah, we wonder, problem? Yeah, everybody now is uh, improve learning and the training and that we want to make a bigger manager team yeah. not only one one person charge yeah. we want to make a at least four per, four people charge we make a group to make a very strong marriage and uh, yeah all all we can think all we can try We, we've been serving this area for many, many years, and we, we want to continue in the service yeah, because the uh, local customer always supporting us. And we want to do better and uh, better service when we turn to them. Yes, well, I, and I think we all hope that this can happen um, swiftly and and have you resume. I don't I don't hear anything that would um, indicate overturning the suspension from our side. Um, so I'm wondering if anybody else has any questions. Um, I just I wondered. Has this come up with this establishment before? Because they've been in town for a number of years. I, I don't know, Sasha, if you can speak to that, if you're new or. 
I joined Susan. the department in February, so I would like to turn that over to Susan. So when I came on board um, almost 10 years ago, the establishment had significant violations that had been inspected by Ed Smith at that time and worked over a number of weeks to make improvements. A lot of them were revolving more around cleanliness um, and sanitation than other practices. Um, then again, approximately, I don't recall the exact time, but approximately five years ago was pre-COVID. Um, we were seeing high numbers of violations again, and it was similar in that I was going back and doing a number of reinspections and education and talking. Um, we had a meeting again, Mr. Um, Jane came in, met with me and with Ed Smith. And at that time, I ordered a consultant um, that he worked with a consultant and I specified the number of weeks and hours and um, topics of training to take place. So that took place over um, a few months period of time. And at the end of it, um, we saw a significant improvement. Um, and then over the more recent years in doing inspections, I did see a number of violations, but not to the extent that we're experiencing um, in uh, this year. So this this has been uh, this is not the first time we we've seen these issues. Um, my my question to Mr. Zhang would mainly be. Um, what would he propose to do differently? We we really have tried uh, to do everything. And I um, would have to know that there's a person in charge that is capable of uh, uh, supervising safe practices. And if he has a plan, uh, who who would he hire? And, and, and also, the extensive days and hours of operation would require that there not just be one person who is qualified, but there has to be a person on site at all times that the food is being prepared and served. So we're talking about two or three people who would be fully qualified to, to ensure food safety. And so that that's, I hope that answers your question. My, my question, yes, and I think he did say that they were going to be four people. He did, but he, you know, we just went through that where he supposedly trained four people, uh, and when Sasha returned to do the reinspections, and none of them were um, following safe practices. It, no. it's, it's really kind of surprising to me that we're we're at this point uh, mm -hmm. that that it's it's pretty clear what has to be accomplished and all of our other restaurants are much more successful in doing this they might not be perfect but they're can successfully uh, manage it uh, to uh, follow through uh, in safe practices which they have already been trained and then retrained and retrained again to do. So I think that we would have to, to vote on whether to uphold the suspension or overturn the suspension. Um, I, I do wish that there was a clearer path to getting this license, you know, back instated um, and meeting all of the guidelines, but um, I'm not sure that there's much that this board can do um, from what we've heard at this point. Does anyone, before we um, take a vote, does anyone have any last comments or questions? And that includes Mr. Zhang. Okay, if not, um, does anyone want to move uh, to uphold the suspension? When, when uh, I have a question, when, when is the soonest it could get resolved? I think it would be the next inspection. 
like if, within a week? If Mr. Zhang hires someone who is qualified and calls us in to, and we would uh, re-inspect and he could demonstrate that this person is able to supervise and implement the safe practices, it could be a, as fast as that. Absolutely, yep. as long as someone's in place. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mr. Zhang has understands that, correct? Mr. Sheng, can you please confirm that you understand that? Mr. Zhang, do you understand? I'm Okay. I'm happy to re-explain. So the soonest that we would be able to reopen the establishment would be, or to overturn essentially the suspension would be as soon as you're able to hire a person in charge who is able to demonstrate their knowledge and perform the duties of a person in charge as indicated by having no violations numbers one through 29, which are the provisions related to foodborne illness, which could be as right as, as soon as you're able to hire somebody who's able to demonstrate that there's zero violations of numbers one through 29. And then you would call us in and we would conduct the inspection. Again, this is new to me. Uh, how do you find someone like that? I mean, is there, do they have to be, do, do they need, is there a course or training or how, do, how does he know that he's getting that person? Mm -hmm. Sure. it's a great question. So one way that we have, there are a couple ways to demonstrate a, a person in charge, right? But a, a person in charge is somebody who holds a food protection manager certificate and an allergen awareness certificate. Okay. And typically across our Amherst establishments, most persons in charge who hold the food protection manager certificate and the allergen awareness certificate can appropriately demonstrate the duties of a person in charge and perform those duties effectively. So typically when somebody holds that certificate as a person, a food protection manager certificate and the allergen awareness certificate, which are requirements of being a person in charge, usually they're able to demonstrate that knowledge because they've gained that knowledge by completing that appropriate certification typically they would be able to demonstrate that knowledge and perform those effective duties. Susan, Thank do you have you. anything that you'd like to add to that? No, I think that that's it. But um, Mr. Zane, you, you've engaged a consultant and the consultant was an effective person uh, and knowledgeable in their ability to train. So that perhaps the consultant would be helpful to you in assessing uh, the skills and competency of a candidate uh, that you could interview uh, for the position, uh, multiple positions. So I would say I would say utilize your consultant again, and and try to establish someone, try to obtain someone that will be able to be effective in the job, will be able to do the job. Does that make sense, Mr. Zhang? Did he hear you? Is he still there? Mr. Zhang, are you still here? Yeah. 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 Mr. Shay? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Ask him if Zing is Ning is Ning with him. Mr. Shay, is Ning with you? Yeah. Okay, the call just disconnected. I'm gonna go ahead and call him back. I also wonder whether it would be a good idea. I mean, what I'm what I'm hearing is that you are that the board is essentially going to make a motion to allow this suspension to stand. 
And that I and that until there is a competent person in charge who, through the inspections that you conduct, demonstrates that they're able to allow, you know, show hold other people to food safe practices. I think that it would be important to put this in writing in Mandarin. And I think that we can do that quickly with our translation service so that it's crystal clear to Dr. Zhang and others that he works with, Dr. Zhang, Mr. Zhang, what's <laughs> happening. <laughs> um, so that would be my suggestion. Um, it would be great if we could get him back on the phone. If not, it seems like you can proceed with what you were going to um, motion, Risha. Yeah, so do... Do I have a motion to either allow the suspension or overturn the suspension? Motion to allow or uphold the suspension. And second it. Okay. So all of those in agreement with upholding the suspension, Premila? Aye. Jack? Aye. And me, aye. Um, but I, I agree with Kiko's. It does not feel like we had uh, clear communication during this um, this yes. meeting. Um, and if there are steps that we can take to make sure that language and uh, technology is not the barrier here. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you very much for all of this work. Thank you, Sasha and Susan. Thank you. Thank you all for listening. Okay, I'm Mr. Zheng is still showing up as a panelist, but since we're moving on to the next agenda item, I'm, and since I don't have contact with him, I'm just going to remove him as a panelist right now. We'll move on to the last agenda item under this new business. Um, so this is um, the body art regulations um, and reviewing the provision requiring a course on anatomy and physiology. I will say that there are a couple of other things that have come up that Susan has brought to my attention in reviewing the new regulations and in translating those to the new paperwork that needs to be um, designed for folks that are applying for licenses. So there may be more things to discuss, which Susan can give us a little um, preview of. But for now, the focus is on this particular issue of the course on anatomy and physiology. And Risha, I'm going to turn it to you because I know you. Yeah, I, I'm actually going to suggest, given that we have 10 minutes left, uh, that this might need to get pushed to the next meeting. Um, I don't know if we want to give a, an intro of what the issue is, but not actually discuss any of the um, possible solutions or, or intricacy, intricacies, um, or if we just want to say, let's move the whole discussion until next month. Yeah, I mean, that's certainly an option. I mean, I think it's also, I mean, just, just to put it out there, the meeting doesn't have to end at seven unless people have not, not the ability to stay on after seven, which I completely respect and understand, yeah. but I just want to put that I, out there. Yeah. I don't have the ability to stay on past seven. Perfect. So. Okay, no worries. Um, um, so, I mean, the, I, I can give the brief uh, overview that I understand, which is that we have put out body art regulations um, but just about a year ago, I think they were passed. And uh, someone from Northampton, a piercer, went to get a license in Amherst and uh, didn't meet the requirement of the anatomy course. Um, and has asked if uh, a different course that's a skin for piercers course would suffice. Um, it does not seem to have the same kind of um, content that you would expect for an anatomy for a piercer. And um, in looking further, there aren't a lot of courses. Um, it is a state regulation, but we have to figure out how it is, uh, what is possible to meet this standard and um, what we want to do for this specific person. Maybe Kiko, you can just say what you've done in the meantime so that uh, we haven't held him up. Uh, yeah, so in the meantime, we did allow the skin course. We just sort of grandfathered that in given that this was all new and we needed to discuss it. As, you all needed to discuss it as a board. So that particular, this person that you're referring to, the one who was licensed in Northampton for many years, where they also do have a provision in their regulations that there be anatomy and physiology course taken. 
is did get their license to practice in Amherst. So, but I think what we want to do is make sure that we have these things addressed and we have the forms updated with all the necessary requirements per the new regulations when the new um, uh, applications are coming in for renewals. And that's happening now. And as Susan's pointed out, there is only one body art establishment in Amherst. So it's not like there's a ton of things, a ton of applications that will be coming in, but it will be important to have um, and we can prepare for it. As I said, Susan, it does have some other questions. So in addition to this question about the anatomy and physiology course, which is, there's a question of accessibility to that course. There are a lot of issues about how challenging it may or may not be to access it, you know, and how, if, if someone can't take a course, would the board accept something else that is you know, deemed acceptable substitute? Those are the kinds of things that the board would need to talk about at the next meeting. Right. So shall we move to your update? Sure, I can be brief. Um, so we've been planning COVID and flu clinics, um, again, in partnership with the Northampton Department of Health and Human Services, because they have a regional grant through Public Health Excellence Program, which allows them to share resources and vaccine. So we are doing our first big clinic here at the Bangs on October 21st, press release went out. We actually have about 50 people signed up already and we're, we will be able to accommodate some walk-ins. So it's a pretty good um, volume. And then a second one on November 13th, also at the Bangs. The October 21st one is in the evening, which seems to be popular. And the November 13th one will be in the afternoon. So those are happening um, and we are, again, relying on Northampton staff to and their volunteers from the Medical Reserve Corps to do that, but we're getting a good response so far. We're also doing a few other vaccine clinics um, at some of the public housing complexes at Clark House and Ann Whalen, just across the, com the you know, beautiful park from us here at the Banks um, and getting good response to that as well. So just doing our best to try to build community immunity when it comes to respiratory illness. Um, any questions about that? Okay, and we're also doing homebound vaccines. So Olivia is available to make appointments for folks who aren't able to get themselves to a clinic. Um, that's something that we always offer. Um, for mosquito surveillance, it was an interesting year in terms of mosquito-borne illness with three cases of triple E in the state of Massachusetts. It's been a while since we've had cases of Eastern equine encephalitis in humans. It's been, I think, since 2019. So as far as I know, none of those cases resulted in, none of those folks died. Um, there was a death in New Hampshire from, of someone who had triple E. So we had triple E back in the mix for a while, and we haven't had for a while. Not, not in the Pioneer Valley, not in Hampshire County. Um, there were no mosquitoes that tested positive for triple E in our area. We do have that contract with Pioneer Valley Mosquito Control District. They do a very thorough job of mosquito testing. Last year, at the very end of the season, um, they found a West Nile positive mosquito. This year, we did not have any West Nile positive mosquitoes. Um, and there was treatment, early treatment that was done in the early summer to, in, area, in that area that had tested, that had the mosquito testing positive last year. Whether that had an impact on what we saw, I don't know, but it's certainly lovely that we didn't have any mosquitoes testing positive for either of those illnesses in our area. Um, there were cases of West Nile virus in the Commonwealth at about the same level that we see normally. So um, it was an interesting year. It got colder faster this summer. We it started to get chilly in the evenings and John Briggs, the mosquito, the Pioneer Valley Mosquito Control District director was saying he was catching fewer mosquitoes in August this year than he did last. So anyway, sort of a mixed season in that respect. Um, but good, and that we didn't have to call off evening activities or anything like that, which is something that we do do if there's a risk of triple E because the fatality rate is so high from that disease. So that's the update on mosquito. Any questions about that, mosquitoes? Okay. Um, and then just from a staffing standpoint, I think you all know that Kyle O'Connor did leave the department. We knew that was gonna happen. He graduated, stayed with us through the summer and then got a great job with the Wor Worcester Department of Public Health as a tobacco prevention specialist. So he started last week and we're very excited for him that he is a fully fledged public health professional working in another, a big health department. So it's exciting for him. Big loss for us, we really miss him, but we are doing interviews for a part-time person to fill his shoes. So I, I did inter interviews this week and we have a couple promising candidates. So hoping that we will have a part-time person to do a lot of his responsibilities, handling inquiries, helping to manage the clinics, um, doing outreach, that sort of thing. 
Um, and then finally, um, I wanted to just ask about our future meeting dates. Um, we had formally been meeting on the second Thursday from five until seven. And that's not a date that Jack can make all the time, like four times a year. That doesn't work for you. Right, Jack? Correct. So we definitely want to have we don't want to have Jack miss four meetings a year. So the what I was going to propose sounds like it might work is the third Thursday, which is what today is um, from five until seven. That does work for Daya normally didn't work for her today, unfortunately. And it does seem like it works for Betsy. Does that work for everybody else? Just trying to make this easy. I think that would work for me. I think generally, yes. I'd have to look at a calendar and make sure we don't hit any holidays and whatnot, but generally, yes. Yeah, I think, I'm, I know, I'm always really want to be conscious about um, the Jewish holidays, which sometimes, sometimes are not on the radar, um, but I think there might be a conflict next year. This year, uh, the Jewish high holidays are, are over pretty much, or mm -hmm. just Sukkot is right now. Um, but I think that it doesn't conflict with Thanksgiving because that's always the fourth Thursday of the month. So um, hopefully that can work. And so let's say that provisionally, if that sounds okay. And then if, the, if it turns out to be something, if you look in 2025 and you see any of you, lots of conflicts for third Thursday, we can revisit, but let's plan for that. And, you know, maybe be in touch. We'll be in touch before the next meeting to make sure that there aren't any major conflicts going forward. So then the next meeting is the 21st of November. Right. That's correct. Does November 21st look good for everybody? Yes, for me. For you too, Jack? I'm, I'm looking. You're checking, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, for some reason I have that. Uh, that meeting is on that day. Really? Why would it be one, two? Hmm. Uh, I think it's just an odd scheduling because it's not, uh, it's not. I don't it's know why. They, maybe because of Thanksgiving, they they did that or something. That's why. Do you want to clarify if that's a one time or a? Uh, I don't want to switch our entire meetings to the third Thursday and then. No, that, there, are, there, that, that, that's it. I think it's only because of Thanksgiving that that happened. That. Okay, so you could meet the second Thursday of next month, which is the fourteenth. Yes. Okay, so maybe it has to be the fourteenth next month, but but then are you are you? Yeah. Then then the, the rest it's always the the, the fourth one. Uh, okay. Oh, the fourth one. I thought it was the second one, the second Thursday. Uh. No, it's the fourth Thursday, and then occasionally quarterly. It's this. I think it's the second Thursday. Quarterly. Oh, and I see. Monthly. Okay, so. Oh. Okay, so I think okay. for November we keep it the fourteenth, and then uh, after that we will move it to the third Thursday. Yeah. Which in which in December would be? Let's just make sure it's not a conflict quickly for anybody. It's the nineteenth. Okay. Okay, that sounds okay. All right, let's do that provisionally, barring any unforeseen changes that people need to make. Let's be in touch with me if there are any conflicts. Yeah, again, I think it's because of um, the holidays or whatever that it's just wonky. But yeah, I this this is, I think, more important than the other. But. Or maybe I'll alternate. <laughs> OK. <laughs> it's uh, the Pioneer you, you Valley. Make... Yeah. As long as you can make the 14th, then, then maybe we can relook at that with you yeah yeah let's do that and and hopefully that'll be a day that works for everyone so we can have everybody um and maybe an in-person meeting we can talk about that later so mm -hmm. that would be great okay. all right i think i have to officially adjourn which is actually get rid of not start a meeting um 
as I said at the beginning of this meeting. <laughs> so is that a vote thing or can I just adjourn a meeting? I think I we've always voted to adjourn before. I don't know if this I know. I'll look up if these but... are required. Um, can I get someone who uh, motions to adjourn the meeting? So moved. I think I can second. So I yes. will second. Uh, you have to. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thanks, everyone. We'll talk Keep next time. Bye-bye. Kiko, Again, can I speak you. with you briefly before yeah, you leave? Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, no problem. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank I'll you. I'll stay on for you, Susan. Bye. Okay. Thanks so much for oh, everything. You know what, Susan? This is still being recorded, so we oh. should... I'll just call you. I'll jump okay, off call me. Call. Thank you. All right. Sure. Take care. Bye. Okay. So she's...